it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you our session chair for the plenary session. She is a lawyer by profession and admitted to the practice of law in the Philippines as well as the states of New York and Maryland and United States. She is currently the executive director of the Philippine Center for Islam, for Islam and Democracy. She is also the director for Islamic Law Studies of the University of the Philippines Law Center and likewise serves as the program development consultant of the Institute of Administration of Justice of the same center. Currently, she is part of the study group of federalism organized by the local government development foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, our session chair for the planning session, Attorney Sapa Perantila Azul. Uh, please, I'm sure you can hear me. 
Anyway, I'm uh, honored to be part of this. Uh, first, I think this is the first of a series following the celebration of the 50th anniversary of ASEAN. And I think today we are starting the 51st uh, year of ASEAN because we have celebrated uh, uh, some days ago on August 8th. I hope you know that August 8th is a revered date in ASEAN history. So today I'm, I'm, I'm uh, quite certain that I should be the first major conference on the 51st year of ASEAN. So may I congratulate Maria for uh, this initiative. And of course, your global partner, uh, PIDS, we're just producers in this uh, 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 effort, and of course, Nina. Somebody asked me, who is she? <laughs> so I said, you better ask them. Uh, I don't want to define who she is. Anyway, this morning we had a very, uh, I use the term I used for the last session. It was very engaging to listen to a personal uh, odyssey that was recounted on how the third pillar of ASEAN was uh, cooked up in the Philippines. And I remember the days uh, when I was DG of ASEAN. We were working on functional cooperation. And this is exactly what we were talking about. And we all thought that the ASEAN cultural and social uh, community should not be the third pillar. Actually, it should be the first pillar. And this was the uh, confirmation in a book called ASEAN, uh, Southeast Asia Search for a Community, written by uh, then Secretary General of ASEAN, Rodolfo Severino. And he said, why did we start with political and economic? I said those were the needs of the early days of ASEAN. So it was imperative that security and political came first, and then how do you achieve that? You go to economic cooperation. But I think that it would have been easier for ASEAN to accept the integration process if there had been an earlier conscious effort to promote the social cultural pillar of ASEAN. But that being the case, uh, we can't reverse history. So I think that my only statement today would be to start the 51st year of ASEAN talking about the third pillar becoming the first pillar. How about that? I was uh, really delighted that we had uh, former President Kapabara uh, uh, Royo to open the session because ASEAN was a really personal journey for her. And if you remember your history, uh, the first efforts to build ASEAN <coughs> came with the three leaders of uh, the Philippines, of course, Malaysia, and Thailand when we thought of ASOP, Association of Southeast Asia. And then when we felt that the big brother was not included, it was her father, President of Ottawa, who said Indonesia should be in. So we had Muffin Indo. I'm sure some of you, depending how old you are, <laughs> can remember ASA. Mafilindo, and there was a visionary in Bangkok, Hanat Thoman, who initiated a letter inviting the leaders, the foreign ministers of uh, the five founding members of ASEAN to play golf in Bangsaen, Thailand, with a, an agenda that these countries that had ASA and Mapilingo should get together. And I uh, just received a book on the speeches of uh, 
kind of form that really signified the uh, vision that he had to invite these foreign ministers of ASEAN. Why am I saying this? I think it's important to have context when you talk about ASEAN. It didn't come like a uh, whirlwind from nowhere. It evolved and it's still evolving. And in the press conference I was asked, has ASEAN transformed? I said transformation may be a big word. I would say it's a work in progress. We're all contributing to that community building in ASEAN. My only qualification perhaps to speak here today is that I'm a princess of Marawi. <laughs> And I was delighted to listen to our sister from the University of MSU. Years ago, uh, one of my really landmark experiences with Mindanao was to bring women leaders in Mindanao to Australia, where I was a master. And I have never seen so many women PhDs in one university as the University of MSU. I heard you're the Chancellor. He said that wonderful. And uh, we just decided uh, we should do something for the women of Marawi. So if that is the direct result of this meeting, perhaps that is a little bit of contribution. This morning we have very precious information. And as I said uh, earlier, this must be a moment of information overload. And, uh, I've decided to do away with my prepared statement, but I'm not going to do any Ramos uh, gimmick that he will throw his speech away. I don't do that. You know, women are very shy to, to do those things. And listening to the last uh, uh, session, again, a very engaging session, reminded me of the time when I chaired the Security Council of the United Nations. In 2004, after President uh, Capogano Arroyo uh, appointed me as the foreign minister, it happened to be the Philippine chairmanship as a, as a uh, uh, non-permanent member of the Security Council to chair. And I said, what could be a unique contribution of the Philippines into the thought process of the Security Council? They're always talking about conflict and conflict and conflict. So I decided to suggest my agenda would be the role of civil society in post-conflict peace building. That was rather a mouthful. And in uh, the first instance, it was rejected. And they said, uh, for you who are familiar with the UN, they said it belongs to the ECOSOC, Economic and Social Council. You know, you women talk about all of these things. I said, no. When you guys make all the wars, who's left behind to do the homework? It's a woman. And all the civil society groups that are brought in, and I'm thinking of this linking it to the Marawi situation. So I went to Kofi Annan, and Kofi Annan said, Madam Chairman, you are the chair, and you decide. So I went into the hollowed chamber of the Security Council, and I said, gentlemen, I'm the chair, and I decide, and our agenda is the role of civil society in post-conflict peace building. Nobody objected. So, I'm delighted again, because I think engaging the civil society as one of the stakeholders in ASEAN, in building the ASEAN community, is imperative. I think the next 50 years of ASEAN should really focus our efforts on bringing the communities together. At the press conference they said, what is your advice? I said, you know, very difficult advice, but I think it can be done because the most, to me, the most challenging uh, issue in ASEAN today is to start thinking as a region rather than of strictly national interest. I think that is 
very, very difficult to attain. Unless we know our countries ourselves very well, it would be difficult to form that ASEAN community. Therefore, I would like to really suggest that the strengthening of the ASEAN social cultural community should really be made a priority in the next 50 years of ASEAN. The question is, how do you do that? Well, sessions like this. In 1992, I brought, I was DJ of ASEAN, I brought the first ASEAN EU dialogue here in Davao, 1992. And there's a wonderful report about it saying, finally, we are getting the conferences to Mindanao. And at that time, President Ramos said, do all your meetings in Mindanao because Mindanao is the front door to ASEAN. It is geographically the closest and culturally there's a lot of commonalities. So I did, and uh, following the bombing of the San Pedro Church, uh, that was the time, and I said, Mr. President, I can't afford to have one EU minister be blown up. That's the end of our tourism with Europe. He said, no, I will send a battalion to make sure that you have your meeting in the world. So, what happened then? I was in Brussels a few months ago, and we had the celebration of the 40th anniversary of ASEAN-EU relations. And I met all the people who were there, because I chaired the meeting, and I said, do you remember of them? What, do you, what is it you remember of the world? Because since then, a lot of EU funding has been coming to Mindanao. Those of you who are aware of it, may be conscious that EU has shifted a lot of its bilateral assistance to the Philippines to Mindanao. And everyone said, oh, we remember the two big tuna fish that you served to us. I said, do you remember the agenda? No. <laughs> Just the big tuna fish. I'm telling the story of the tuna because 15 years later, the EU is our biggest market for Mindanao tuna. We were able to negotiate for the entry under the GSP Mindanao tuna for the EU. And I hope that we will keep supplying them with the wonderful tuna that we introduced to them in 1992. It takes so little, but it takes a bit of human uh, context, human interaction, for people to remember things like where do we put our funds? Let's think of Mindanao because we had our Mindanao ASEAN EU relations in the area of the Philippines. So I do hope that there will be a follow up to this session in terms of engagement of Mindanao, and I'm addressing the people of Mindanao, of Davao especially, and the Minda authority to take a more active uh, posture in terms of engaging with ASEAN. At the press conference, I was also asked, what can they do? I said a lot. First, we have to learn about ASEAN. So it was a press conference on ASEAN 101. And I think we all here today have a role to play in bringing forward what ASEAN is all about. Certainly, the low level of awareness of ASEAN in the Philippines is also true in some of the other neighbors. But in order to address this, I thought, why don't we engage a wider community of people, not just the, not just the uh, president, vice president, not just the officials, but widen the community that should be aware of what ASEAN has been in the past 50 years and contribute to the next 50 years of ASEAN. So what did we do? We organized the first in ASEAN, the ASEAN Society of the Philippines. 
And when I mentioned this to one of the former ASEAN DGs, uh, Ong Teng Yong, he said, hey, that's a good idea because we need our own population to know more about ASEAN too. I said, you can do that after I launch mine because I want to be the first. Anyway, we have launched it. Our chairman is uh, former President Ramos. And there's a paper on all your tables. If you can write your name and if you're interested to join us in this journey to make the next 50 years of ASEAN truly people-oriented and not just in words or in declaration, but in our deeds, in our thoughts, and in our uh, engagement with the region. Time is up, and I'm well advised, and I'm very obedient. Thank you so much for this meeting. Thank you, Ambassador Albert. Now we have our marching orders as we look to strengthen the third pillar. First question is how? How do regular citizens of member states of the ASEAN help to strengthen the social cultural pillar? And this is where our next speaker comes in. Uh, he has been in the forefront of peace building initiatives, not only in the Philippines, but across the region. Uh, currently, he's the executive director of the Initiatives for International Dialogue. He is also the regional initiator of the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. Uh, his uh, CV reads like a consummate a professional deeply engaged in local communities, strengthening uh, concepts of peace, and reaching out, especially in co uh, communities in conflict areas. So let's hear what Augusto, what we, who we fondly call Gus Miglat, has to say, and how to energize local communities and CSOs in our, as what, Ambassador Albert has asked us to do uh, objective of strengthening the third pillar. Yes. Uh, thank you, Salma. I was cringing a bit when you were introducing us a while ago. You've raised a lot of expectations of what I have to say. <laughs> now I, <clears throat> I'm not going to throw away the prepared uh, uh, speech because I don't want to detour from what I wanted to say. But allow me to also say first that since this morning, a lot of the things that I've heard uh, resonated with the things that I'm going to say. And if you will notice later, uh, in fact, I uh, copied pasted some of those thoughts uh, with proper references, so I won't be uh, I won't be charged with intellectual property rights uh, violations. But uh, good afternoon, fellow ASEAN lawyers. Uh, allow me first <clears throat> to thank uh, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, the Mindanao Development Authority. The Asian Society and the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN East Asia for the honor of being invited to this gathering of academics, experts, and officials engaged with ASEAN's social cultural community pillar and ASEAN at large. I am awed that ordinary citizens like myself who have been critically engaging ASEAN, together with my cohorts like Alex before, in the regional civil society movement, have been given space in offering a perspective that may not necessarily sit well with some, but hopefully not 
with most of you. I am humbled and a bit intimidated that I am lodged in the same panel with our eminent foreign, former Foreign Affairs Secretary and Ambassador Madame Delia Albert. We had the privilege of engaging with her amiably and constructively during her stint at the TFA. And we in civil society will always be grateful to her for introducing, as she just said, the role of civil society in post-conflict peace building in the agenda of the UN Security Council when she chaired it in 2004. In fact, I must say, this might have led to Secretary General Kofi Annan's challenge to civil society for us to develop a movement around this. And that is why GPAC was formed and established in 2005 at the UN headquarters itself. I've since considered that a turning point in civil society's attitude in engaging governments and multilaterals on peace building. And I'm sure at the end of this public symposium, which will be a few minutes now, we will all be enriched with a million insights that could be as diverse as the region that we all belong to. The challenge for us, I believe, is to find the complementation of valid ideas and weave all this, our distinct viewpoints together. The ASCC is one of the three pillars on which the ASEAN is founded. And it's usually mentioned as the third one after its two cousins, the AEC and APSC. Sometimes the APSC is also stated ahead of the AEC. But never, to my recall, has the ASCC been cited first. Is it because it is the most intangible of all the pillars? Yet, ironically, it is also the most felt. To my mind, the chronology or billing given to the ASCC would be reflective of how ASEAN subconsciously views its significance. Is the ASCC third grade? Well, since this morning, we've been hearing it's not. Never mind the espousal of integration or having those catchy and beautiful ASEAN slogans like being people-centered, people-oriented, and one caring and sharing community. But in truth, those catchphrases do capture the very essence of what an authentic ASCC could and should be. But the fact is, from our perspective, ASEAN of today is still mainly a club of states driven, driven by their political elite and by and large remains inaccessible to the ordinary citizen, the peoples of the region. It is a group in whose priority seems to be the building of an AEC and an APSC. Yet whom do both pillars actually serve? The AEC aims to integrate Southeast Asia's diverse economies into a single market with more than 700 million people, totaling a combined gross domestic product of 2.5 trillion US dollars in 2014. But again, I wonder, as I want with such big numbers, how much of that 2.5 trillion dollars actually benefited that other big number, those 700 million or so citizens of ASEAN? Because the reality on the ground is that ASEAN allows a free rate of the market and thus seems to pander more to corporations in its pursuit of economic integration. This policy may have resulted to rapid economic growth rates, yes, but has also found us treading a path of rising inequality. This perception was affirmed by an area Research finally shared earlier this afternoon by media review, showing that ASEAN peoples believe that inequality was among the region's top three problems, including corruption and climate change. And not one of them was about economics. According to the ASEAN People's Forum, to which I belong, 
hunger and food and heat security remain a huge challenge as farmlands are rapidly converted into export crop and biofuel plantations. Sharp economic disparities manifest across and within countries and from local to regional levels. No wonder the APF also observed that in ASEAN, both social and cultural inequities reinforced by patriarchal norms and practices are deepening, with vulnerable communities pushed further into the margins, though so many years of exclusion and discrimination. And it is this marginalization that has likewise bred the conditions of despair and a sense of hopelessness, particularly among many of our youth today, who now perceive little prospects for a future with a meaningful state left to them in their respective societies. Many of them are now experiencing genuine, genuine despair and growing existential fear that now, that now ever stronger pushes them to clasp that extremist interpretations of their faith and culture that sometimes graduate to violence. Thus, it is not surprising, as we heard earlier, that our region is now being touted as the next frontier of violent extremists after the recent debacles in Syria and Iraq. And if the festering Malawi siege is any indication, it is here in Mindanao that the seeds of this catastrophe may have found fertile ground. It is doubly tragic that religion is being used to frame this narrative. And it behooves me that the request initially to conduct this panel was to be in the context of Islamic states in the region. Was there any unconscious premise that building a social cultural community in the region would have to contend with Islam? Again, I'm just wondering. The APSC, meanwhile, in peace, suggests that by 2025, ASEAN shall be a united, inclusive, and resilient community where the ASEAN people shall live in a safe, harmonious, and secure environment, embrace the values of tolerance and moderation, as well as uphold ASEAN fundamental principles, shared values and norms, close quotes. These are undeniably lofty ideals. And one characteristic being advocated on this vision is for the ASEAN to become a, quote, rules-based, people-oriented, people-centered community bound by fundamental principles, shared values and norms, in which peoples enjoy human rights, fundamental freedoms, and social justice embrace the values of tolerance and moderation and share a sense, a strong sense of togetherness, common identity, and destiny. I'd like to stress that again slowly, if just to let it all sink in. Rules-based, people-oriented, people-centered community in which peoples enjoy human rights, fundamental freedoms, and social justice embrace the values of tolerance and moderation. But what is this actually, we must ask? Do our governments follow their own rules and laws? Do our peoples enjoy human rights, fundamental freedoms, and social justice? Are the citizens of the region, those who may have other ideas, beliefs, and profess alternatives to the ruling order, and who protest and dissent tolerated, nay respected, Take a few seconds to visualize these images around the region. Cambodian workers, peasants, and settlers driven away from their land or rounded up and jailed. Mind-boggling amounts of Malaysian state funds reportedly siphoned into personal accounts of the highest government officials, while opposition politicians and peaceful Percy activists are hailed to court and jailed on atrocious charges. Thai students and activists gone missing after merely raising a symbolical three-finger salute a la Hunger Games, defying the junta that took power over a democratically elected government. The Rohingya people scattered and living in fear of genocide and their catchy and shunned counterparts 
incessantly displaced by unremitting pounding rants and military assaults in Burma and Myanmar. Vietnamese lawyers, bloggers, and monks arrested for their beliefs or daring to offer dissent. A religious celebration strictly banned in Brunei. Ramon Magsaysay Awardi Song Bat Song Po, whisked away by police and still missing in Laos since December 2012. Young Singapore digital activists and stalwarts of the puny opposition party jailed or fined into bankruptcy. A populist Indonesian governor booted out of office after a massive hate campaign was launched against him. And here in the Philippines, things of Marawi, of Mindanao and its peoples, of the Bangsamoro, the Lumans, think of Marshall Law, of Gina Lopez, of Judy Tagiwa, of what this government could have been. And think of Kian Lloyd and Santos too, and the hundreds, perhaps, Thousands were unseen and bearing notice like he that we lost in this ongoing war. Did I say war? Of course, there are attempts to concretize the proud pronouncements of Asayan, but from the ground looking up, it is hard not to see them as token tribute, even as we continue to engage these entities to make them more relevant. When Asayan has established a hum regional human rights mechanism, is it at all empowered to protect the human rights of our peoples? Or is it even obligated to say something about the human rights conditions of citizens of any member country? There are other instruments as has launched that prepare to implement and pursue its novel principles. There is now a mechanism that's supposed to be looking after the welfare of women and children. And recently, an institute for peace and reconciliation was created. Yet again, I wonder, if functionaries, bureaucrats, or diplomats ex exclusively operate these mechanisms, perhaps, and whether civil societies are already presented. Will the defense ministers of the country mainly oversee the APS in Pilar? Perhaps there are some slots there for friendly academics. These new bodies have since been meeting regularly, adding to the 1,001 meetings a year the ASEAN conducts. No wonder, ASEAN is oftentimes dissed by cynics as nothing more than a huge talk shop with little to show afterwards. So, it is heartening that there are efforts such as this initiative that focuses on ASEAN's third pillar. One that aims to unravel how to build the social future of community in the region, in the context of nation building. I am glad our keynote speaker this morning mentioned the importance of having a social agenda in the Sahel alongside the pursuit of economic and political goals. For it is in this pillar that the participation of peoples and civil society is most possible. I hope the ASCC is given more attention and priority by the leaders of ASEAN, but more so by the peoples of ASEAN themselves. I believe the ASCC is the glue needed for all the three pillars to truly work. And it is essentially important for the two other pillars, ADC and APSC, to fly and reflect their being people-oriented and centered. But the supposition here is that ordinary citizens are represented and actively involved at all levels of these mechanisms. A robust ASCC can thus lay the foundation for our peoples to have a modern, vibrant society where peace and justice prevail for development and progress to ensue. My time is up. I have two more papers, uh, two more pages, but I guess I have to also follow my, my mentor and help. I have to be very obedient to this. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening. If you want to read the other papers, the two other pages, I will just read the paper. Thank you so much. the whole day today, there are some efforts actually, bigger positive initiatives 
that helped, I think, thus strengthen ASCC. And um, before we proceed with the open forum, let me just acknowledge the presence of the head of the Mindanao Development Authority, your fellow revolutionary class, Secretary of the We have time for questions from the floor. to address these major challenges 
that are happening in our region today. But if one can look at the hot field class, the peace and stability to me is the greatest gift that ASEAN has really brought about. And uh, if you look at our history, we were, we were not exactly warring tribes, but we all had our fundamental issues with each other. And ASEAN has become a platform to address many of these national concerns. But it has been very much an elitist uh, meetings at times, because you only have people, sometimes converted people, talking to each other. And I think widening <coughs> that community uh, dialogue or conversations can mean a lot for the next uh, 50 years of us. So I, the dream, of course, is for us to speak as one voice. We are not really. We have a long way to go to get there. And uh, efforts like this and uh, other initiatives uh, among the Eurovision asset style, perhaps was one that was mentioned today. Uh, we already started that in the celebration of ASEAN, where we had young people singing together, getting to know each other. Perhaps there is hope for the next generation to think we are ASEAN, instead of thinking in terms of who I am on the national level. That's a dream, and I think it has come in the statement of the invitation of uh, uh, Donald Coman when he invited the foreign ministers, and I saw this letter, he said, Dear Mr. Secretary, this may be a small beginning, but it's a good start, and I look forward for a greater, uh, for a greater cooperation. And he did talk about integration. But I think he had the vision already that with a small step, ASEAN can move forward. I think all of us here today have made quite a step in listening, in exchanging, and uh, certainly dialogue like this could help make an ASEAN approach to the challenges that we face. Um, in the eight pages that I was read, uh, this is where I posited uh, what the ASCC would achieve in some recommendations. I think the diversity of ASEAN and the differences of inter different interests of different groups can be more of an asset than a liability. But the, the, I think the, the point first is to embrace them, respect them, and uh, accept them. And only when we honor these differences and these different interests can we try to start building and moving for this uh, collective goal and build this uh, common community that we, that we aspire for. One of the things that I was going to posit was uh, first supporting all peaceful struggles for self-determination of the peoples of the region. Before we build a regional social cultural community, shouldn't we first build our respective social cultural communities in our respective countries and nations? And even within our nations, there are little ascendant nations that also need to be recognized and be accepted and respected. And these, I think, have been papered over in all of this pursuit of integration. One of my other uh, recommendations here was perhaps we also need to look at the framing of the ASEAN more of cooperating first rather than going at once with an integration mantra. Let us try to do cooperation rather than integrate at once uh, each other. So this is a, this to me I think uh, is not a liability, these different interests. Uh, all around us, the youth, the women, the just, I think it would be even, it would even make the, the region and our respective countries even stronger if each, each state or each government, the, the inter-regional body of that, as that would uh, uh, conduct policies or develop policies 
and mechanisms that will integrate this, uh, this, uh, these processes. I was glad to hear the opening remarks of Professor Nishimura when he said that uh, Japan was very, uh, very uh, supportive of the participative uh, aspect of a, a process like this in the If we just put that into practice, then I think uh, we will go There's a question I, I was confronted with when I came back and I retired from service. And I said, what can I do? So when I saw one of the publications of Korea, Framing the ASEAN Social Cultural Community Post 2015, I, October 2015, I saw a wonderful list and they've made quite a study of what each one can do. It's a wonderful shopping list. And as a housewife, I start life with a shopping list. And then I go over the list. Have I done this? Have I committed to this? And I think ASEAN has committed itself and member countries of ASEAN with all the thousand and how many something? Thousand two hundred meetings a year. In committing and committing. But I think what needs to be done now is to go over the checklist. Have we done it? You have a very clear cut <coughs> list of recommendations taken from project and background papers from ASC blueprint. And if each country would look at it and do a real accounting. I work in an accounting firm now, so uh, accounting to me is, is very important. One has to be accountable, and accounting is a major activity that we should do, especially as we celebrate 50 years of ASEAN. Have we really done a lot? So I decided, hey, we haven't really done these commitments. I remember raising two of this in 19, some time ago. I don't think we have done it. So modestly, I said, why don't we get together people who have been thought leaders in ASEAN and get them together so that they can perhaps advise, perhaps counsel, decision makers and policy makers. And that's really the main rationale that we have in organizing our ASEAN society. Also because the three pillars have not been talking to each other. I can see where you're coming from. The political people are not talking to the economic people, the economic people, I know, I've been there, and I am guilty of not talking to the other pillars when I was doing functional cooperation, because the economic uh, responsibilities and commitments are being done in the Department of Trade, the uh, other department is taking care of the others, and I'm taking care of the functional cooperation. And I think we've come to a point where these three pillars should now get together and 
act together. And I think this is what we're trying to do now. We've started to do. And uh, luckily, we got a uh, personality like uh, President Ramos, who, by the way, is the son of the one of the founding fathers of ASEAN, and who happens to be, have been my first boss. So I, I, I feel deeply that what the fathers of us founding fathers really envisioned uh, may have been rather beyond our imagination. Because if you look at the visionary statements, uh, it, it was quite ambitious. But uh, Donald Coleman was really pragmatic and looked at small initiatives. And so I was inspired by that and I said, us in society perhaps engaging everyone who, who cares about our region today may be a voice. Uh, we may not be heard all the time, but I think we can be heard some of the time. And uh, that's why I joined you if you are keen to do it, we are starting off with uh, several projects like partnering with the Philippine uh, Council for Is Islam and Democracy for a forum to address the prevention of violent extremism in ASEAN. You can really only do it step by step, subject by subject, and we, we, we really can't address everything at the same time. And another uh, uh, session we, we will have will be to get all our thought leaders together and ask them to be engaged with the community at large. I mean, these are small steps, perhaps, but they can build up towards the next 50 years of ASEAN. And hopefully, Peter 3 becomes Peter 1. If we sing together and our voices are I think there are two ways that the society can respond to, and one way of saying that. Well, that means whether or not civil society is recognized or accepted by the official ASEAN entity, it will continue to do what it's doing, doing the people-to-people -people engagements, etc., that we've been wanting to do. And that is, I think, the, the essence of it all. And uh, that is why it would indeed uh, be building a a regional social cultural community that doesn't have to be called ASEAN. Uh, already, uh, we know that uh, the ASEAN summits and the ASEAN processes have been shadowed and engaged by civil society. And one of these processes is the ASEAN Civil Society Conference, ASEAN People's Forum. And this year, since the Philippines is chairing it, and it will also be held here, the Opponents of the Philippine chairship also of the ACSC APF is already discussing alternative regionalism, which a long time ago Alex already was proposing. We are going beyond just looking at engaging ASEAN as ASEAN, but already developing alternative regional uh, processes if we don't see ourselves within ASEAN. So that is one way that the civil society can foster this view or build this view among people. So whether or not ASEAN as an entity recognizes uh, these efforts, it's up to them. But this will forge on, this will, this will proceed, even as they will also decide whether or not to continue engaging ASEAN and its governments. The other way, of course, is continuing engaging ASEAN through ACSC, APF, in whatever spaces there, there, there will be. Even if we are critical, or some of us are cynical, some of us still believe and one of them in engagement. There will always be windows where we count our blessings. We don't expect uh, uh, mana from heaven to fall at once and civil society takes over and say, that's not the point. We will uh, push the envelope, so to speak. But of course, uh, the other side of the point is up to us again. If you really also want the uh, people orientedness and people centeredness and participation, then walk the talk, bring the people into a sale. And how do you bring people into a sale? Don't just bring business in, don't just bring academics in, once in a while. 
bring civil society into your mechanisms. Into your mechanisms. Take, for example, the newly created AIPR, the ASEAN uh, Institute for Peace and Reconciliation. You already have the CPR ambassadors as the counts, as the governing and policy, whatever. It behooves me that its advisory board is again people by government functionaries. Why can't it just give it to civil society? Other countries do, Thailand in initiative. There was a time HR, why can't you also open up to civil society uh, persons to be part of this mechanism? Why can't the ASEAN Secretary have a desk or a, a permanent whatever uh, outreach or NGO desk or something just to continue engaging ASEAN? Why do we have to why do we have to engage ASEAN every year, year in and year out during the ASCC negotiating that 15 minute interaction with the leaders and then it won't happen because one or two governments will choose their own civil society representative. Can you believe that? Civil society being chosen by governments to sit and engage with them. As, of course, it's a long way to that. I mean, that's the reality. But still, we push it. We have to push those things. And I challenge the Philippine government now, which is chairing this uh, ASEAN summit, to perhaps out, outdo the other governments that have been trying to uh, include civil society in its processes, especially that we are supposed to be the, supposed to be the bulwark and champion of democracy in this region. But that's another story now. We have Ambassador Albert say the last word. In ASEAN, women have the last word. Actually, we're having a wonderful uh, ASEAN women's meeting next week to confirm that we have the last word. But uh, uh, referring to your, your intervention, I would like to know if there are resolutions. Uh, this is what we do in ASEAN uh, society, to, have, to engage government, to engage uh, uh, everyone. And, and then take it up to be part of that decision making, hopefully. But it's up to us to make ourselves heard, to be taken seriously, and to come up with very specific um, interventions that may help chairmanship of Philippines, chairmanship of uh, Singapore, which is coming next. Uh, uh, I just, I was in Singapore recently and they did a fantastic uh, oral history of ASEAN uh, in order to engage people, what they think about, thought about it then, what they think about it, about it in the future. And perhaps activities like this, a converging point where decision makers, civil society, and other in, other interested parties can meet because one has to have a dialogue. And I think uh, if this is one of the uh, major decisions that will come out of the Consulti Patronus here, and then I'm sure he's taking notes to take up to the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, what would be a major contribution of Philippine chairmanship in engaging the wider society? And I think we would need your contribution. Uh, it doesn't have to be a resolution or anything. But you know, in, in ASEAN, it's all processes. You, you have to know how to get yourself heard, how you, you can get results from your thoughts, your ideas. I think it would be very useful if this group or anyone can come up with, or this particular meeting can come up and say, this is what we discussed, and we, this is what we would like, perhaps the Philippine chairmanship to present at the final session 
in November and perhaps pass it on to Singapore. Because that's how ASEAN works. You, you have to work, it's like the UN, you have to work within the process. So what is it that we want? What are the specific things we want? Rather than telling them, we should do this, we should do that, say, this is what we can do together with you. I think that would be very useful for the Philippine Chairmanship and uh, may get to the November statement. Uh, Saudi listening. And uh, that's how things happen. Sorry? Yes. So I think it would be a, a uh, wonderful contribution of this particular session. So uh, with that, I think that uh, would like to uh, end. And uh, at the press conference, I was asked, how can you summarize ASEAN? I said, oh, the press always wants sound bites. So I said, remember four Cs. ASEAN has achieved a charter. It was tough to do it, but we did it. ASEAN is working on a community. ASEAN is working on connectivity. And ASEAN is working on centrality. What those means, that's your homework. And you can submit that to the organizers. So that will be your precious gift to the evolving ASEAN social cultural community. Thank you. sharing their insights and perspectives on how CSOs can be engaged and how CSOs can can uh, create their own space within ASEAN. And Madam Albert, I'll add another a fifth C, an energized CSO network in ASEAN. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think we need to have our photo. Okay, that ends our um, plenary session for the day. So we are requesting our panelists as well as the session chair for a Google session.
where member states have to look at how the region can max maximize its potential by liberalizing trade, investing on digital economy, or creating an environment where small and medium enterprises can further thrive. There is also the political and security, security aspect where stability and peace in the region have to be ensured. And then there's the ASCC, the third pillar, which is becoming and should be the first pillar as, as we mentioned here. And no doubt, all the three are interrelated. It's difficult, you know, to, to really put them in silos. But to my mind, I think the ASCC is the heart of the Asian community, more than being a group. What is a community without the social cultural aspect of it? As in, it has come a long way, but it should always be a work in progress. Not, not that it cannot be completed, <laughs> but that this is an evolutionary process. We will be evolving into something, yeah. I don't know, but the hope is we evolve into something good, something virtuous, something resilient, something that upholds you know, being good human beings. And if we all work together, I think this is really, this is achievable. So long as we continue to communicate, continue to share ideas, continue to praise what is good and, uh, and condemn what is evil. Anyway, all the efforts, all of, we have done so many things and all these efforts are diminished and the goals will be difficult to achieve without instilling in the minds of the people the, ever, the relevance of ASEAN and its integration in our, in our lives. And this is where the role of strengthening the social cultural aspect of integration comes in as, the others, as, 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 as an important, really important um, pillar. In a region where 10 diverse cultures come together to form a community, it is important that its people understand the beginnings and journey of ASEAN. And we are so fortunate to see, hear it from people who've been there in this conference. For Filipinos, it is important that they are aware of the country's huge role in the establishment of the region. We should be proud of it. I would like to encourage you all to think of in innovative ways to get to know ASEAN more and to involve, be involved in the discussions. Most especially the young ones. Technology is so different. It's, it's, it's changing the world. It's almost difficult to understand the millennials now. But they are our future and Hopefully they will be as engaged, or maybe they will be because of this technology, than, than we are. And, and really maybe this, what, the, what we have begun, uh, what we want it to be, you know, a, a really good, a really good um, community. So the future, I think, is really bright for ASEAN. But we have to remember that all these benefits can only be found if the ASEAN people themselves appreciate the organization and its membership. Only when they appreciate and understand the significance of ASEAN in their lives, will you get people to really move. And with that, it will become easier to reach our goals and get past the resources. So let me end here and allow me to convey the sincerest appreciation of PIDS to our co-organizers, Elia, Minda, and the ASEAN Society on behalf of the, our President, Dr. Gilbert Yango. We would also like to thank the speakers for taking their time to share their insights on how we could make the ASEAN social cultural community work. I hope that as you leave this hall, you will carry with you a stronger appreciation of the important role that ASEAN plays in our lives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Magala. And to finally conclude this um, very successful and inspiring public symposium on ASEAN social cultural community and nation building, may we call on the
The chairman of the Mineral Development Authority, Secretary Dr. Hajj Abul Karalonto, he is also the Philippine Science Minister for Bintiaga. In terms of tourists knowing and approaching our aspirant groups. 
but I hope that through public discourses such as this, we will be able to gradually create an ASEAN consciousness, one where we recognize that our South Asian neighbors are more than just our trading partners and political allies, but are also our partners for change and development. By fostering people to people connectivity, we are building an ASEAN community that is free from the political, racial, and cultural biases. This is, after all, what the beautiful start of ASEAN is all about, taking peaceful and humanitarian steps in the midst of disputes and differences. It's been a long way, a long day for everyone. It's time to give yourself a tap on the back for being a part of this public symposium. And let's make sure that we impart all the learning and realization from today to our colleagues and friends we need it there to our state schools and offices. Every ASEAN story is a building block for a fully integrated ASEAN community. Now, before I thank you and, and say to you the rest of the night, please allow me at least a few minutes of your time, allow me to go down to earth. Malawi city is under siege. It is burning. Malawi city territory is part of a greater ASEAN community. Malawi city, like Bangkok, like Bali, Turban, Malawi is safe, is under siege. By the so called Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant or the ISIS are referred to word and the plural meaning. Malawi is under six years, but these are not part of the moral liberation movement to free themselves and to free ourselves, to restore that dignity, that honor deprive us that sovereignty and freedom that we lost. No, sir, this is not a world of liberation. This is a world of annexation. Because we wanted to live in Malawi, Marawi, a capital of the so-called ISIS, with a perverse ideology which is even blasphemous to refer to it as Islamic or to refer to it as Muslims. No. It's not a world of liberation, but it is us now, as I have told the president, with the declaration of martial law, declaration of martial law, we have crossed the Rubicon, and it's in perhaps it is destiny by God's intervention. We have crossed our Rubicon, and our Rubicon is Malawi, because our people, we have come in solidarity <coughs> and in unity with our president, asking him to extend martial Because this Malawi, we are now ready and prepared and our people have supported us, declaring war against this ISIS, against this multi-group so-called criminals, strangers, barbarians. Our people came out open in support of martial law, in support of the president, because it is to their future, their future to our state and their children. Marawi City has always been the commercial center, and in fact, for many decades back, under the American rule, it was the center of government in Mindanao. We had the first airport, we had the first golf course. Managed by Manila Hotel, the first Dansalan country club. We have all this historically. We have Dansalan country. We have people, particularly people from Manila traveling to California and moving around that mountain area. You have the Pendleton Camp Center to work here. And it's more beautiful, differently, as the Americans say, so I've gone to that city before World War II. But after World War II, Malawi was forgotten and forgotten. Dan Salim, what's his name? 
was coming to it anything. Because we did purchase it for the corridor. General MacArthur, President Kizor, slipped out of the rock, went to the cross, then took again the oro on the night of the 16th, 17th of March, 1942. They went to the house in a hotel owned by a German couple, none of this than Southern to have famous for its work costs and money by money out there, just to keep the spies around, but to talk with Sultan al of the moral people. And on that very fateful night committed, that if the moral people will join the Allies, the rights will be restored, not necessarily a separate state, but which the Sultan agreed, that it will be within the unfettered Philippine Commonwealth government, that they will accept but it will be a home rule, a simple rule. That is what the moral people have been fighting for all these years. This word liberation is to restore our right on a self rule, as we may now refer to as the autonomous government. And we are not talking about this peace process. Ladies and gentlemen, our fellow Asians, we are called culprits in peace in what is happening in Morocco. The leaders, the people. Because we also have the longest running peace process in this world, even longer than the Palestinian and Israeli peace negotiation, and nowhere to go. It is now time, and we have said for the first time we have a moral president, a moral, a son of Mindanao, a leader of Mindanao. But perhaps it is a divine intervention and wisdom that we have in today, because we will work that closer to this world and the leadership. We will end it so that there will be no more other Marabis. What is happening not only happening in Dabo then, or may happen in Kabanti or Ligan, or even Palantuku, or Chakrati. But we are now, and now we are serving as the sacrificial law because we will pin down the ISIS in that area. We will finish this war for you so that this freedom of an Asian, a peaceful Asian that we want, will prevail. This is our dream and this is our aspiration that we need your help to in rebuilding not the old Marabi, but a new Marabi, a new ASEAN city which is free from drug, free from violence, and this can only be done with the first and foremost centerpiece of this government program that this nation made him, taking him as a president and impressing him as the leader. We offer the country not only to get rid of this country of the drug trafficking and the violence that we are into and corruption, but a genuine change, and that is federalism. The Mineral Development Authority will be convening the Old World Convention to address this problem and bring the banks and more people to the national discourse of federalism. Because this is the battle of the minds and the hearts, and it is only the instrument that we know that can not only put it into this world, but immediately hasten and fast track the development of Marawi. And when I'm talking about Marawi, I'm referring to the conflicted areas in the south, the home that we wanted to go to, the home that we wanted to take back. And this is where we need the nation's support, not what we have been hearing in the newspapers looking at it and watching the television, only this key and I sympathy with that family. The family of this young boy that was killed. Nobody wants it. But have we talking about the dates that's not happening in Monaco? Have we talked about the damage that we are going through? And we accepted it with open arm that we offered our warm bodies that we can also participate and help our armed forces so that we can put an end to this difficult Diverse ideology that is that engulfs definitely the world. Ali Paul in Syria and Mussolini back in Era is enough for this world. Let's not have another Marawi. Marawi must be, we must have to put an end to this. Otherwise, this world cannot go. The ASEAN cannot have what you want. But it is the assurances that we convey to you. That is support we are extending to our president is that it's not only for our community, but for the American ASEAN, 
that can participate in world politics that can participate in the international community so that we can have a greater voice, a peaceful ASEAN will have a greater place in the community of nations. Thank you and good day, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Secretary Alonso, for that um, message and closing remarks. So this ends our public symposium on building ASEAN social cultural community and nation building. Thank you for all the participations from our speakers, our panelists, our session chairs, and our um, organizers, the ideas, and from Minda, thank you very much. So this is your host, Jimmy Musa from Mindanao Development Authority. Thank you very much. And thank you.